Alright guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week we're going to be getting enough of the electronics in the C14 to make it go. We've got another of these cheap 10 amp ESCs from eBay. Others are available, but this is the same one we used on the B1 and that seems to work okay. For the receiver, we will be using a 3 channel Flysky. It's fairly compact, so with a little luck it will fit behind the servo on the servo tray. So we can actually get at all the gubbins, we're going to need to remove the cab. We've done this at least once in each of the C14 videos, so suffice to say we just remove the six screws and remove the cab. Then remove the two screws from the cab mounting plate and jobs are good'un. We fitted the servo and set up the steering last time, which leaves a nice little gap for the receiver to go in. Now, on the B1 we used a high-tech HS65, which is a little bit smaller than the Chinese servo, and it went together like it was all designed to fit. This time things won't quite be so straightforward. It's close, but the receiver is a good couple of millimetres too wide. We could cut the back of the servo tray so the receiver can poke out, but that will seriously weaken the structure. Now I've got a feeling if we remove the receiver's case, it's only held on with four tiny screws and no clips, it might just fit in the gap. And would you believe it, it's a perfect fit. There's just the tiniest bit of extra space, which is perfect as we can wrap the receiver in some insulating tape so it's got some degree of protection. Just a single layer is all we're going to be able to fit. The main thing is to try and cover up all the pins on the back so they can't rub through anything underneath. So we can stick it in, we're going to need to remove the nub on the right of the recess. A quick trim of the Dremel is all we need to do. Now we have a flat surface, we can stick a couple of bits of servo tape down to the plastic so it's there and ready to stick down the receiver. The servo leads are going to get folded up and stowed away in the recess under where the receiver's going. It'll keep them nice and safe, stopping them from flapping around in the breeze. The ESC is going to mount up on top of the servo with some more servo tape. The switch for the ESC fits in the stock mounting position, so that's all nice and straightforward. The tricky bit will be the battery and motor connections, especially the battery as it's way too short. We'll tackle the battery lead first. We need to splice in some extra wire to extend the length. With the ESC held in position we can work out where the splice needs to be. To make things tidy we'll position it right up next to the end of the receiver before the wires leave the servo tray. Ok, clip the wires strip some insulation and tin the ends. Do the same with some suitable wire. It doesn't need to be all that thick as the current drawer on this rig isn't going to be all that high. Pop some heat shrink over the wire stubs and solder up the joints. Shrink the heat shrink and we're halfway done with the battery lead. We can stick the ESC down now with some more servo tape. We want to make sure the four fets are facing upwards and open to the air. If anything's going to get hot it's going to be them. Next the servo wires get folded up and tucked away in the recess under where the receiver goes. They need to be neatly folded up and not just stuffed in there so they stay put while we stick the receiver in. Now we can use the lid from the receiver case so we know which way the connectors need to go. It's one of the disadvantages of actually removing the case. Now that's all held in place we can work on the other end of the battery lead. It's exactly the same procedure, just that this time we need to make sure the connector is nice and accessible through the toolbox lid when the cab all goes back together. I think we're also going to add a bit of tape around the motor and battery wires just at the end of the receiver. The mounting screw for the servo plate does stick out a bit, so we need to take some extra steps to protect things just in case they rub. Before we take the rear tray off to access the motor, we'll scratch a little mark where the battery wires come into the battery area. We'll cut a small slot here to clip the wires in so they're not flapping around in there. Next the rear tray can come off. There's a screw that goes through the rear cross member and a screw on each side of the chassis. Remove all three and the tray can lift away giving us unhindered access to the motor. Our kit came with a Beck lead that we can use to wire up the motor. From what I've been reading it can be a bit hit or miss whether you actually get one, so you might want to order a couple, even if you don't need one here they will come in handy at some point. One side of the motor does have a red dot which is most probably positive, but rather than trust the dot we might as well tack the wires to the motor and give the rig a quick test just to make sure it's all working. I've already set up a model on the transmitter, it's all default so there's no special programming involved. We can plug the battery in, now I'm going to use the 5 cell NICAD that came with the B1 just on the off chance something goes catastrophically wrong. It's going to be a lot easier to throw that out the window than a flaming LiPo. 
This time though, it all seems to be working well. The truck's going the right direction with the throttle. Now we can finish the install, knowing it's going to work straight away when we've got it all covered up by the cab. Right then, starting at the front, we can install the switch. We've got a lot more clearance above the switch than we had on the B1, so all we need to do is attach it with a couple of screws that's left over from the kit. There aren't any that are quite the right size, but the number ones are close enough that they'll do the job. For the motor wires, we'll aim to have the BET connector lay flat along the side of the gearbox. This means the black wire is going to end up quite a bit shorter than the red one, as it's nearest. So we'll cut, strip, tin and solder that one first, followed by the red. The idea is to try and set up the wires so everything naturally sits in the right position and none of the joints are under stress. And just to make sure, we're going to use a little bit of survey tape on the connector just to stick it down too. Even with the vibration when running, the solder joint shouldn't see any stress or movement. Before we refit the tray, I'm going to cut a little slot where we marked earlier. Just a quick attack with the Dremel will do the trick. With that done, the rear tray goes back in with a single screw into the cross member at the back and the two larger screws that go through the chassis into the gearbox mount in the middle. Back on the top, we can slot the battery wires into the tray. Now, we could leave it like that, but to add a bit of extra stress relief, we'll wrap a couple of turns of electrical tape around the wires so they don't get pinched. We'll be connecting these up to a 2S LiPo, so we need to be extra careful to be sure things can't short out the battery. Eventually, we'll be fitting one of these mini light controllers to control the headlights, tail lights, and the roll bar lights but I still haven't had a chance to sit down and really crack on with the firmware. So for now, it makes sense to wait rather than install another incomplete module. Next, the cab mounting plate goes on, but watch out, unlike the B1, this one gets a bit tight and can very easily pinch the wires. Rather than mess about trying to get the wires through a very tight gap, we might as well mark up where the wires come and trim the plastic for clearance. And don't forget the antenna while you're at it. It doesn't take a lot, and once the plate gets screwed down, you can see the wires are sitting nicely and they're not bent up trying to squeeze through the small gaps. The antenna especially doesn't want to see any tight bends. Which brings us neatly to mounting the antenna. We don't need to do anything too special with it. The only things to watch out for are the tight bends in the coax and keeping it away from the drivetrain. The easiest method is to simply tape it along the back of the cab mounting plate. All that's left to do now is remount the cab with its two screws above the grille, two screws under the bonnet, and reattach the roll bar and toolbox lid with its two screws. Then we can pop in the 2S LiPo, and there's loads of space in the battery box. We could probably fit a bigger LiPo that wouldn't fit in the B1, but this will do for now. Switch the power switch on, and we can give it a quick test. Well, it seems okay, but crawling over my hand isn't exactly a good test. We need to head out into the woods. Well, it may be small and cheap, but I do think it looks the part. With a bit more detail and lights, it's going to be punching well above its price in terms of appearance. It did have one little problem though, which I didn't notice right away. I thought it was struggling a bit to climb over more things than I would expect. Then when the front axle got caught up, it became obvious it's running front wheel drive, which was rather annoying. There wasn't any clicking coming from the gears, and picking the truck up had the gear spinning normally. Turned out it's the first yoke on the rear of the gearbox slipping on the shaft. Nothing to be too concerned about, but it did shorten the trip. So, the first thing to do next time we work on the truck is going to be fixing the drive shaft. Shouldn't take too long to get it all locked up. But for this week, that's your lot. So as always, thanks for watching. Like if you liked, subscribe if you haven't, comment if you've got something to say. Now, I do read them as they pop up in my inbox. It's getting to the point where I'm going to have to set aside a bit of time each day to reply to them, as I'm a little bit behind at the moment. Anyway, that's really it now. Bye guys!